Okay, as our, our custom is, we've been talking about uh, receiving and ministering healing for a while. Um, right now, we're doing a review of the miracles of Jesus that we covered. There were 22 of them, I believe, that we talked about. And we went through pretty well detailed about how he did each of these things, how he met with a person, what adjustments they had to make, how he had to get them into position to receive, how he ministered healing to them. Uh, and hopefully we've learned some lessons about how that's supposed to operate, how that's supposed to take place. Let's, let's read our verses today. Uh, we like to read, there's three verses that we're doing that are kind of the theme verses for this whole uh, little series that we're doing. So let's read those out loud, beginning with Psalm 1720. Psalm 1720. Here we go. God gave the command, sent forth his word, and healed them. So they were saved, rescued from dying, destruction, or their pits. What happened first? He gave the command. He sent forth his word, and that word healed them. That word saved them, rescued them from dying, it rescued them from destruction, it rescued them from their pits. You don't have to go much further than that to say, well, that's pretty good stuff right there, that all he had to do is send forth his word and get you out of whatever pit you're in. If we embrace, if we hear, if we obey, if we follow the directive that he spoke in that word and do what he said, the results are guaranteed. Just a matter of time. Mark 16, 20. Mark 16, 20. And I've got three different versions combined here. Ready? And they went out and preached everywhere while the Lord, Master, kept working right with them and confirming the message, proved that their preaching was true validating the message with indisputable evidence by the attesting signs and miracles that were performed that closely accompanied it. Closely accompanied what? It. What was it? The preaching. The message that they proclaimed. Would you say that their message was the full gospel? As much as they knew, yeah, it was. Is that the same gospel that we typically hear in our services today? I hope so. I'm not going to bet that it is. I bet that we water it down. I bet that we change it. I bet that we uh, make excuses for it or we don't want to mess with certain things. So we don't include that anymore. Go ahead, Daniel. Oh, I was going to say that I think that they really need to pull the because they didn't preach anything other than they hadn't had years of tradition to mess it up they hadn't had years of misinformation years of bad experience to learn anything different that they somehow managed to incorporate into their theology yeah it would have been a purer version of the gospel than what we're doing now, now hopefully there's a, a return hopefully we're getting back to the place where uh, we we're getting closer to that original gospel and when we get closer to that original, what can we expect to happen? Signs, wonders, miracles, following it, accompanying it. When we get our message right and when we get ourselves right to the same place back where uh, they were. But it's interesting that he kept working with them and what they said. He confirmed what they said. He acted, he validated with indisputable evidence what they said. Not necessarily their lifestyles, although their lifestyles, I'm sure, were fine at that particular point, but what they said. It is important what we say. What was the verse? Psalm 107.20. You're welcome. Okay, Acts 4, 29-31. Acts 4, 29-31. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. Last week, we talked about this boldness idea. Sometimes we think of boldness as being all up there up in your face. They're they're real aggressive. They're real, almost like attacking. And we call that boldness. And to some extent, it kind of is boldness. But what does this talk about when it says boldness? Confidence. And I gave the example of if you go get directions from somebody 
And the person you get directions from says, well, I think it's kind of over there. And you go down this way a little bit, a couple miles, maybe it's five. And then you turn right, or maybe it's left and you go a block, or maybe it's two blocks and it's the fourth, no, it's the sixth house on the, are you going to get to your destination? Are you feeling good about the fact that this guy just gave you directions? On the other hand, you go up to somebody and you ask the same place. Okay, I'm going to such and such place. Oh, yeah, I used to live over there. 1.2 miles this way, turn left, fourth house on the right, and turn right again. I feel a lot better about the second guy than I do the first. What's the difference? Was he more arrogant? Was he more persuasive in his argument? Yes, he was, but it was based upon him being more confident about what he was talking about. He was able to be bold because he was confident. He wasn't wishy-washy. He wasn't, well, maybe this will work. I'm not really sure. We're going to try this. This is a great theory. The boldness comes as a result of being confident, being fully persuaded of what you're saying and the fact that God's going to back you up when you do say it. All right. Let's read these. Uh, we've, we've made some notes as we've gone through, some kind of the, some key points. Let's, let's go ahead and read those today, uh, just for the sake of doing it. We haven't done it in a while. Everything that Jesus said and did is a direct revelation of the will of God for all people for all time. So if he ever said it, if he ever did it, it applies to you. How can I say that? Why do I know that? Well, if it doesn't apply to you and it did apply to them, he's either changed from you to them or he's being a respecter of persons from you to them. And we know he's not either one of those things. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God is no respecter of persons. So if anybody ever got something from him, you're entitled to that same thing, assuming you're willing to do what they did to get it. And if Jesus ever said anything to anybody about a situation, it applies to you, assuming you do what he said to do. So when you make yourself available and, and subject to the same instruction that he gave them. So if you ever saw Jesus do it, if you ever heard him say it, that's awesome. You can mark it down. It applies to you if you're willing to do the same thing. If you say what God said, then God will do what you say. Now think about that a minute. If I am filling my mouth with what God has already said, and then when God does that, could we say God did what I said? Because you started by saying what he said. You're coming into agreement with him. Uh, there's a verse in Isaiah that says, command ye me concerning my word. That's pretty bold. We get to command God concerning his, and I'm not saying we're in charge at all. I'm not saying that. But he wants us so much to be in agreement with his word that he is so willing to back it. All he's getting us to do is say, you get to direct me when you use my word about that situation. I will eventually do exactly as you just said, because you're already in agreement with me. What power that is. What a requirement, what a demand on us actually doing the same. And we skip that. Oh, God knows the thoughts of my heart. Yes, he does. But he needs you to say it. He needs you to activate it with your words. He needs you to put it in your mouth. He needs you to give him marching orders, so to speak, from a certain perspective. You don't get to tell him how to do stuff. You, you certainly don't get to tell him when, through whom, uh, how long this is going to take, or what the answer looks like. But you do get to direct him concerning what the answer is. And it is agreeing with what he already said. We also learned pride makes excuses. Humility makes adjustments. Pride makes excuses. Humility makes adjustments. Now, have you been on both sides of that coin? As you think back on your life, God's telling you to do something, and it's like, well, I don't want to do that. And I don't have to do that because of this, and I shouldn't do that because of this, and, and I don't need to do that because of this other thing. Instead of saying, okay, God, if that's what you're saying, I don't understand how that fits. I don't understand how that works. I don't understand how that applies here, but I'm going to humble myself. I'm going to make that adjustment, and I'm just going to let you be in charge. Big difference in the outcome. God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. And it's all about, am I going to make excuses for this or am I going to make an adjustment? 
the root of it is really somehow we think God's wrong. And I'll just give you a hint. Uh, he's not wrong. He never misses it. He never messes up. So if there's anybody that's messed something up in this situation, I'm going to guarantee you it's you. It's me. Don't blame God. Assume that he's right. Assume that his word is right. Assume that, that everything that he did is right, that the sending in is, is working. It's on the receiving side. I, I heard about a guy one time that uh, got a new car or something, and the, the radio station wasn't picking up. His favorite radio station wasn't picking up. So he gets all upset and calls the radio station. He goes, I can't pick up your radio channel. I can't pick it up. Well, we're broadcasting, sir. I'm sorry you're having a problem, but we are broadcasting 100,000 watts. You shouldn't have any problem receiving our signal. Who's right? Is, is the signal being broadcast? I'm sure they're certain about that. I'm sure they, they have instruments, they have meters, they have something that say, yes, we are broadcasting. So the fact that this dude couldn't pick up the radio station in his car, what does it mean? He hadn't figured out how to work the radio yet. It hadn't auto-tuned to his channel. The problem is on the receiving side, not on the sending side. And that's always the deal with God. If there's an issue, if there's something that doesn't seem like it's working right, check us. Don't get mad at him. Check you. Don't get mad at him. I know that's not grammatically correct, but it makes the point. Second thing, faith will work in your heart with doubts or thoughts of doubt in your head. The guy with the son. I brought him to your disciples, and, and he couldn't heal him. If you can do anything, help me. And Jesus responded, if I can do anything, I, I can do whatever you want if you can believe me for to do it. So it's not a matter of me being able to do something. It's a matter of you being able to believe that I could do something. And then his next statement was, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. What's that talking about? He had some belief in his heart, but his head was still having a real problem with this. And the boy got healed anyway. What does that mean? Faith works in your heart, even with doubts and thoughts and questions in your head, because faith is a spiritual force coming out of your heart, not a force coming out of your head. And the devil loves to play in our head. I mean, that's his playground. So if you're on the process of, of working your faith in the process, you're getting close to seeing this breakthrough, where is he going to attack? He can't stop the faith part. He can't stop it from actually trans, tra taking place, tra transpiring. What can he do? Start jacking with your thoughts and get you to doubt, get you to let go of the progress that you've already made, and then he wins. I uh, think back to Galatians 6, 9, uh, be not weary and well-doing. In due season, you'll reap if you faint not. Other translation, that's if you don't give up or quit. The only way you lose is if you let it go. The only way you lose is if you stop. The devil can't beat you. He's already a defeated foe. So what's his purpose? To drag this thing out as long as possible until you relinquish your authority off of that situation. Your words off of that situation. Till you change your opinion change your mind about it, say something else, give him something else that's authorized to happen. Uh, we already talked about this a little bit. Never blame anyone or anything else for your inability to receive. It is your inability to receive. Thank God we don't have to be ignorant. We don't have to be, we just don't have to sit there. Well, I just can't receive this. Yes, you can. What are you listening to? What are you feeding yourself with? Are you giving yourself an opportunity to change? Are you giving yourself an opportunity to grow in that area? What are you, are you listening to the doubt all the time about this? Or are you listening to faith-filled words? Are you listening to Jesus' instructions? Are you going back over these tapes? Are you going back over these lessons? What are you listening to? Because even if you have an apparent inability to receive at a moment, you can change that. You can fix that. That's totally within your control. And it doesn't take much faith to be able to receive. Mustard seed, you'd say the mountain, jump into the lake, and it has to move. We get messed up about that, too. We think it's going to move immediately, well, and it can, but it doesn't usually happen that way. What usually happens is, well, I spoke to that mountain, and most of it's still there, but the next week you get a big rain, 
Well, part of that mountain starts decaying and starts falling off into the, the river, into the lake, eventually into the ocean, a little piece at a time. And you keep speaking to it and you keep talking to it. And then the wind comes and it blows pieces of it off. And then uh, other things happen and it blows pieces. And you go after there week after week after week. And then and you look at it and you go, hey, that thing's shrinking. It didn't just get up and move, although it can. It usually doesn't work that way. And we get bent out of shape because it seems like it's taking too long. Who gave us the right to determine the timeline? Where's that chapter and verse at? I want that verse. I need that verse. Yeah, the one where you get to control the whole. The whole yeah. Go ahead, Daniel. Seven. Oh, yeah, seven. Seven days. Seven days. And let it go, and then then you do lose. Yeah. Uh, an interesting part about Jericho is uh, what was it? One time around the first seven days, and then seven time seven times around. Is that right? Seven times, seven on the seventh day, right? And it wasn't until the seventh time on around on the seventh day that the walls fell. But that was the point I was going to make. Could any of us keep our mouths shut long enough to walk around that city? once a day for seven days and then on that seventh day to walk around that thing seven times without opening your mouth on the top of it yeah which i don't know that i would have participated in anyway but <laughs> seems a little risky to me but why did god keep their mouths shut you got three million people walking around this city and that their battle plan to capture the city is oh we're going to walk around there we're going to shout now, that is crazy. I mean, that requires faith of, of a high level to, to buy that mess. Can you imagine all three million of them getting into agreement with that? So God said, I'm not even going to mess with you. Fool you with all that. Y'all are going to walk around that thing, and you're not going to say a word. You're not going to have the opportunity to mess this up by the fact that you don't have a clue what's going on. So keep your mouth shut until it's time to open it. And then I'm going to tell you at that moment what to say. It's a good lesson there. You can't say anything nice. Don't say anything at all. Our parents used to tell us. There's more truth to that than we realize. And some of us would do good to learn what I call the vocabulary of silence. That your situation wouldn't improve if you just shut your mouth rather than opened it and uttered whatever garbage was about to come out of it. Right, until they open their mouth. <laughs> All right, so those are some thoughts that we've had as we've gone through this. Let's go back to our, our actual lessons. Uh, we've gone through one through 16 in the previous what, three reviews. This is the fourth one, I think. So now we've got 17. So lesson 17 was about the man with dropsy. You can find it in Luke 14, 1 through 6. Uh, it was initiated by the Holy Spirit. Was faith mentioned? No. Was faith evidence? No. So it was purely a God-responsible activity. It was him just showing, I love people. I'm willing to do things uh, for people just on special occasions, just because. And that's a great component. That's a great thing about God. I'm not willing to wait for my healing for that situation. And what we've been talking about is you don't have to. You can get in faith about your situation and get that thing handled, get that thing moved, get that thing changed. You do not have to wait on you being the lucky one one day and winning the heavenly lottery and God just deciding at random without any work on your part, you doing anything. Uh, one of the chief priests 
invited Jesus over for dinner on the Sabbath. They also invited a man with extreme swelling of the limbs and joints. Interestingly enough, they made sure this man was sitting right across from Jesus where he could see him. So what do you think they're doing? Tempting him because this is the Sabbath day. Will he heal? Let's see, you got sickness in the house and you got Jesus in the house. Two plus two equals... There's probably going to be healing today. So the interesting thing about that to me is the Pharisees had more faith in Jesus's willingness and desire to heal than most church members. They expected it to take place. Now, their motives were wrong. I mean, their motives were absolutely messed up. They were going to use it to accuse him. But just talk about the faith. Just talk about the expectation. In their mind, there was a very strong possibility. You could almost even call it a certainty a calculated risk that Jesus was going to heal this guy on the Sabbath. What would happen to our services if we had that same expectation? If we came into our services expecting the healer to show up and to heal, we expect it where salvation is concerned, where people come to the front. I've asked this question here before. If 100 people came down to the front to get, give their lives to Jesus, we fully expect that all 100 of them will leave with their lives changed, right? Same 100 people come down to be healed. How many people do we expect will leave healed? The difference between those two numbers is the degree to which we have been messed up about healing. Because they were purchased at the same time. They were purchased the same way. Healing is a component of salvation when you study it out. The price for both has already been paid. So the difference in those two numbers is we expect the one, we haven't had any bad teaching on that. We know that God's going to have, God's going to do that. And if we don't expect the same number on the other side of it, that just means we have been filled with all sorts of junk for the most of our lives. And we're having to undo all the stuff that we had learned or unlearned or whatever the case may be. It's very indicting to me to, to do that little exercise to myself. It's like, okay, I've come a long way. My number has gone up, but I'm still not at 100. What would it take to get at the 100? More time. Stay at it. Keep filling. Keep displacing all that junk with truth. Keep replacing all that junk with truth. I am sure that Jesus asked the Father if he should accept the invitation. He didn't do anything except what he saw the father do. He didn't say anything except what he heard the father say. So was his being there accidental? Did he just find himself there? It was intentional. I'm sure he knew the motives. I'm sure he knew what was going on. I'm sure he knew this was a trap, but he went anyway. Sometimes God will send you to people or places, even though they won't receive what you're going to be saying. Jesus went anyway. He knew that he was probably going to get into an argument with these people. And he had no problem with that. Now, if we get an invitation to go somewhere and do something, and we know going into it, they're not going to receive you. Well, why bother? Why go? God, what's up with this? Somehow we think that just because he sent us means they're automatically going to be receptive. Does our going have anything to do with their receiving? You, you could just be planting seeds, yes. But is that our problem? Is the reception our concern? God tells you to go, you go. It doesn't matter what you are received. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter if you leave and you're the hero or you're the goat. It, it makes no difference. Now, go, and I don't mean greatest of all time. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> scapegoat. Let's say scapegoat to be a little more clear. Go ahead, Janice.
Over and over and over again. Yeah. And and so it's it's like their faith, even though they saw all that, like it just was so tiny. Like, I don't know. So I, I I'm still wrestling with this and I don't know what the right answer is because it almost seems like the right prayer was like remove all the drama, remove all the stuff, like the long messages of the world that they heard in the church and like help me believe what you say, you know. And, it also, for me, it shows even when we see Christ do all of this, sometimes our faith still be like, I don't know, Jesus, I don't know, even though he's pushing. So that's why I'm trying to look at him to be like, to be like, this is that kind of guy on my nerves. <laughs> but it does, when we as humans, we do that, even though we like see Jesus do all this work, we still be like, I don't know. I think a lot of it, it goes back to we're not fully persuaded. And, and that's really the, the, the governing factor here. Uh, it's not, okay, faith or doubt or whatever. It, how persuaded am I about this? And if we're not, if there's still doubts, if there's still things going on in our mind, what does that mean? I haven't put enough attention on God's truth about this yet for all that other stuff to disappear. i am still got too much belief in this other report in my experience, in my tradition, in there's something else that's determining what I am believing at this point. I'm not fully persuaded. So what's the next step? You, you keep doing it over and over and over and over again. You plant that word intentionally in your own heart and let it grow, let it harvest. You keep planting, you keep planting, you keep planting. What are you doing? Uh, I like it like this way, displacement. Uh, you, you fill a glass of milk and drink the milk. It's all gone. Good milk still residue of milk in the glass, right? So if I first start pouring water into that glass that had milk in it, it's going to be cloudy for a little while. But if I keep pouring new water into that glass and keep pouring and keep pouring and it keeps overflowing and it keeps overflowing and it keeps overflowing, what's eventually going to happen? Eventually all the milk's going to go away. Eventually, all the other stuff is going to go away. All the things that are re reducing our certainty, our uh, persuasion, our confidence, our boldness about it, because we're so consumed now with the truth, with the new, fresh, pure insight and revelation. So I, I, I view it as progress. Don't view it as, oh, I'm going to beat myself up because I'm not there yet. View it as I'm at least starting to evaluate this thing differently. I'm at least starting to consider this differently, and I have come farther than I was. But on this particular issue, it's still a matter of me getting in there and me getting it settled in my life, in my heart, in my mind. And once you get it settled, you don't have to think about what you're saying. Which is getting rid of the doubt. Right, right. You're not attacking the doubt. You're not necessarily praying against the doubt. You're replacing the doubt. And keep in mind what we just said too—that it is, it doesn't really matter if your doubts in your heart, in your head. Your head can still question what is going on here, and it still happen because your heart is where your faith comes from. Think about Mary. She gets the announcement: "You're going to, by virgin birth, give birth to the Son of God." Okay. Wow. Hello. Think about the magnitude of that statement. Do you think she understood at all how that was going to happen? 
I mean, the answer was the Holy Ghost is going to come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you and then you'll conceive. Okay, I heard you say that. Does that mean squat at this moment? I would still have all sorts of questions about what is going on here. And yet her answer was, be it unto me according to your word. Where's that coming from? Her heart, her head was still clueless. Her head was still like, whoa, mind blown, tilt, tilt, tilt. And yet she did it anyway. Right. And what's happening there? Your, your head is processing this before your heart gets an opportunity to weigh in on it. Doubt your doubts. Make it a conscious decision to doubt your doubts. You have this thought of, well, I don't think I can do that. I doubt that I doubt I can do that. We're just replace it immediately. Go right after the fact. Okay, you're a liar, devil. And what you just told me is a lie. So immediately I'm going to replace that lie with something else. Exactly. Exactly. Right. How he works this out, the details, that's his problem. It's not mine, not my concern. I struggle with that. that I'm one of these people that like to have it all figured out and lined out before I undertake the journey. What I'm learning is if I wait until I have it all figured out, I'll never undertake the journey. I'll never even start the process. And if I did start the process and God went ahead and did it, who will I give the credit to? Uh, some of it will go to me because I figured this out. Now, some of it will go to God too, because hopefully it's big enough that it's not anything that I can really do. But I pride myself on the fact that I figured it out. And that's a problem too. God loves to put us in situations where we can do absolutely nothing about it except trust him. Except hear what he said and take a step forward in that direction, even on nothing other than what he said. I think back to Peter getting out of the boat, walking on the water for a little bit. He's the only one that did it. The, other, the others in the boat had the option and they did not do it. So he walks a few steps on the water. Only the second person in recorded history to have ever done that. Probably from that point since, I'm guessing, I, I, I haven't heard of too many other people that go walking on the top of their swimming pool in their, in their backyard. Although I've heard of some people trying. Anyway, um, so he, he walks on the water for a little bit. And then he has this little issue and he, uh, Jesus saves him, pulls him back in the boat. Peter, why'd you doubt? Now, don't you know that in our society, that dude is in therapy the next week. <laughs> Think about this. Oh, they're just so abusive to me. I'm the only other person to get out of that boat. And all I hear when I get back in there is, Peter, why did you doubt? It's just so wrong. None of them stepped out of the boat. Where were they? Why didn't they do any of this? It's just unfair. Can't you see that playing out in our society today? Him getting beat up about Jesus correcting him for where's your faith? Because you didn't finish this out. You were doing fine. You did great. You took a few steps on the water. Yeah. When you ask Jesus, is it okay to come? He said, come. But when he looked at Jesus, he walked on the water. He looked at the waves, he saw the sky. Right. So our focus is off from God, right. off from Jesus. When you look at the circumstances, you will pray. Right. That's good. Yes. And I don't believe G that Peter turned his head. I, I believe his eyes were still focused on Jesus. I, I don't see him knowing what he knows. Hey, this is kind of cool. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, I, I don't see him doing that. What I think happened is he's looking at Jesus and a wave comes between them. And for a moment, he can't see Jesus because of the wave. So he gets back into his head instead of the faith that was putting him on top of the water. And now he's trying to do this in his head. And it's like, oh, I'm not supposed to be out. Right? 
it, it's not a matter of us like deviating and looking around, oh, yeah, this is cool. For a moment, we can't see. For a moment, we can't clear. For a moment, our, our vision is lacking. So we have to go back to the trust part of that. Not the fact that we can see, but our trust. And I think that if he would have just remained calm when what I believe is that wave was between them, the moment that thing subsided, he's still on top of the water and he keeps going. But kudos to Peter. He was the only one to try it. We beat him up. You shouldn't have doubted. You shouldn't have looked away. You shouldn't have done whatever you did. He's the only one that got out of the boat. Would you have gotten out of the boat? Can you say you walked on the water for a few steps, however far it was? I can't say that. Right. That's so cool. How did you do that? How'd that feel? Right. This is after he gets out of therapy for Jesus uh, chastising him for his lack of faith. We, we think about this and it's like, we get too serious too quickly. We're, we're analyzing the performance, not the steps involved. <clears throat> think back to how Peter started that whole conversation. He asked him, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come to you on the water. How else was Jesus supposed to answer that? No, it's not me. You have to stay. I mean, he had already put it in motion. If it's you, let me come walking to you on the water. I said, Whoa, where'd that come from? You're wanting to operate in a faith level that's unparalleled in human history right here. Who am I to deny you? Who am I to say no to that? Yeah, come on. So he starts coming. And then something happens. And he loses his focus momentarily. And in that moment, he gets back into his head. I'm not supposed to be here. This storm is just crazy. This, this is nuts. And he immediately starts thinking. Okay, our guy with drops it. Back to him. Uh, Jesus sitting across from him at the dinner table. The Pharisees are expecting, I wonder if he's going to heal him. I wonder if he's going to do it. And he does. Jesus gets you tired of sitting there watching this. He, he can't bear this. So he heals the guy. Obviously, the Lord told him to. The God, the Father, told him, led him to do this healing. He just didn't do it on his own accord. He is being directed to do it. And then what happens? They kick the guy, the healed guy, out of the room. Because Jesus is about to have a discussion with the rest of them that are there. So Jesus kicks them out of the room. He goes about his business. He's happy. He's thrilled because he's now healed. And then Jesus goes right after the elephant in the room. You guys, uh, let's think about what we're, you're upset because I just healed this guy on the Sabbath day. But what would you do with your animals? If your donkey, if, if your cow, if your bull, if your sheep falls into a pit on the Sabbath day, will you go get them out? The answer is, of course, yes. Will you think about it? Will you have a prayer meeting about it? Will you ask God, God, is it your will for me to go get the, the dog? Get the horse, get the cow out of the ditch on the Sabbath day. You're not going to do that. You're not going to kneel down next to the animal that's in distress and pray, oh, God, if it's your will, give me a sign that I'm supposed to get uh, fluffy here or, or whoever out of the pit, out of this hole that they've fallen into. No, that's craziness. And yet that's what we, that's the system that we're trying to put in place on the Sabbath day in our churches. God, you can't do that here. You can't do that today. You can't do that that way because it breaks our rule. Who are we to define how God can do things, when God can do things, through whom God can do things? And as a result of our rules, we miss God's move. Stated another way, do we think more like Jesus or more like the Pharisees in that situation? Somebody comes and they get healed. And you're like, whoa, 
the person that prayed for them was totally drunk or uh, that was done way out of order. They were really loud at that part of the service. It was very distracting. Or that shouldn't have happened up at the front like that. That should have been happening over in another room or over somewhere else. Whatever, whatever thing we choose to put on that situation when it happens, whatever rule in our mind they broke, are we more upset about the rule being broken or are we more thrilled that the guy got healed? And if the, any of those things ever come up and it's one of those things where, well, I'm really a bit out of shape because this just didn't fit my order. This just didn't fit my box. This just didn't fit the way that I think things should go. You need to really carefully evaluate what's going on with you. Because what you're saying is it's more important that the rule be followed. It's more important that the, the tradition be upheld than it is for this person to walk away free, to walk away healed. And I say your priorities are messed up if that's your, your attitude about it. All right, that's enough of that. 18, the woman with the spirit of infirmity. The woman with the spirit of infirmity, Luke 13, 10 through 17. Initiation was the Holy Spirit. Faith mentioned? No. Was faith evidenced? Yes. This, like so many others, was teaching on the Sabbath day. Jesus was teaching on the Sabbath. Now, as you might guess, this results in somebody being healed on the wrong day. Now, how many of our miracles did Jesus do this on the Sabbath day? I, I, it was maybe half. It, it was not uncommon. I mean, it was very frequently he did this. Do you think that he was trying to make a point? What point was he making? He's available all the time. Your calendar doesn't matter. Yeah. What else might he have been trying to say? I'm God. You're not. I can do whatever I want to do when I want to do it. And if you have a problem with that, that is your problem. You need to fix it. Think about how much easier, if you want to say it, Jesus' life would have been if he just healed all these people on Monday rather than on the Sabbath. Been a whole lot less confrontation. Been a whole lot less discussion. His ministry would have probably been as effective, but his direct attack on their understanding of what the Sabbath consisted of, absolutely not. Uh, one of these it's uh, it's like you, you should have come any other day of the week to be healed not on the sabbath day and the answer is uh, well when is your healing day okay we met we, we did this wrong when is your healing day one of these people they had 18 years maybe it was this one i don't know we had this had this person in our services in our churches for 18 years. When was your healing day? When did we miss that? They didn't have a healing day. They didn't care at all about this person being healed. And that's just huge. That's just an indictment to me. In our churches, do we care about people being healed? Or are we just caring about people coming and getting born again? Is that the only number we track? I'm not saying we have a problem here. I'm just saying our, our thinking, our, and maybe we do have an issue here. I don't know. Where's our heads at? Are we reflecting the heart of God in this? Are we reflecting the sum total of all of our bad traditions and bad religiosity and bad accumulation of tradition? And uh, what are we saying? Have you ever noticed that Jesus did a lot of teaching and preaching? Those things are also part of the works of Jesus. I, mean, I want to do the works of Jesus. Well, part of that is teaching and preaching. Does it matter what you teach and what you preach? Well, if you want to get to the rest of the works of Jesus, yes, it does. 
If you want to get to the signs, if you want to get to the wonders, if you want to get to the healings, the miracles, then yes, it does matter what you teach and preach. Teaching, preaching, and then healing. We should minister the same way. If we need ministry, we should understand we should come to hear and then expect manifestation of what we just heard. Like we started the class with. A demonic spirit had prevented this woman from standing straight up for 18 years. Despite the difficulty in doing so in her condition, this lady made it to church that day. Now, how difficult would it be if you couldn't get to the mirror, couldn't get brush your hair, couldn't brush your teeth, you're bent over, you can't straighten up, and here you are trying to get ready for church? Would you have been at church that day? I'm not, I'm not, you don't have to answer the question. I mean, if that were your condition and you could not stand up, would you have been in church that day? Or is that just too difficult? Is that just too complicated? Is that just too much of an issue for you to make the effort to come to church that day? Something was telling her to go. I, I believe that too. Yes, I believe that spirit was telling her that <clears throat> you got to go today. Today, right. And then. Uh, in hindsight, I'm glad she showed up that day. She's yeah, probably she thrilled she throw, showed up that day. Did she not know any other travels? When I read the text, it doesn't tell me one way or another. I get the sense that she's there frequently, that this isn't the first time that she's there. So she makes the effort required to get herself ready to go to church in that bent over condition over and over and over and over again. Kudos. Kudos to her, kudos to her uh, diligence, kudos to her effort, her willingness, kudos to her. And God met her, God rewarded her largely because of that. Jesus begins ministry to her by saying that she was loosed or freed from her condition. Now stop right there in the story. She's been over and Jesus says, you are loosed from that condition. At that moment, is she free? No. She had, to receive it. she had to receive it and act on it. So Jesus says to her in that spot, you are loosed from that condition, and yet she still wasn't loosed from that condition. Or was she? Which is the, the, the real determining factor here. She was. She just had to receive it. It hadn't been carried out yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm playing on this dichotomy between what Jesus said and what is real for a few moments. Sometimes in our lives, Jesus will say, you're the healed, you're the blessed, you're the saved, you're the delivered, and you don't feel that way. You don't act that way. You don't believe that to a certain extent because it's not true in your body. Which way are you going to go? Which way are you going to believe? Are you going to say, I don't really care what you just said. My body, my circumstances still feel like this. Or are you going to say, it doesn't really matter what my body is telling me. It doesn't really matter what my cravings what my desires what my self is saying about the situation you just said i'm free so i'm going to act like i'm free jesus was calling those things that be not as though they were he was speaking faith words to her he offered her the opportunity to agree with him. She did agree because the next thing we see is Jesus touch her and set her free. But she was already loosed. So what's she just waiting on? Why didn't he just touch her at the beginning? He had to have her agreement. He had to have her get involved in the process. He had to have her change her mindset about what was true in her condition. Then Jesus could do the rest of it. Jesus required this agreement before he actually ministered to her. Had she not have done that, I believe the story would have stopped right there with the woman still been over. Then the pastor has a fit. 
Now, can you imagine this lady? Let's just say she's been a regular church attender for 18 years. And she just got healed one Sunday morning. And the pastor goes nuts because you shouldn't have done that today. What kind of pastor is this? What motivation would he still have to be upset about this lady being healed after being sick for 18 years? Jealousy, envy. He's a hireling. He's not called of God, whatever. I mean, there's a whole bunch of answers here. None of them are right. None of them are godly. None of them are holy. So just because the pastor says something, does that really mean that God's saying something, that God is doing something? Not necessarily. Line it up with the word, judge it, determine it for yourself. Yes, absolutely. So Jesus gets involved. The pastor goes nuts. He has a fit about, oh, you shouldn't have healed her today. You should wait till tomorrow to heal her. And Jesus could ask, okay, when's your healing day? When was your last healing service? Was she at your last healing service? He didn't have one. Of course he didn't have one. Jesus knew that. Because the guy's not motivated by healing this people. He's not motivated by making sure his sheep are in very good condition. He's motivated by his power. He's motivated by his authority. He's motivated by the, the kudos and the pseudo respect that he has, the control that he has over these congregants. Jesus jumps right in the middle of that and says, you hypocrite. <laughs> now, how funny is this? In your church, your pastor has a fit because somebody gets healed in the wrong way, and Jesus appears in the flesh there and says, you hypocrite. Whoa. Wow. In his own church. And then he goes through another example of this animal in distress. He does that three times in the miracles that we have talked about. Three times he likens a person being sick to an animal in distress. Or in one case, an animal that just needs to be watered loose from the stall and taken to water. Would you think about this on the Sabbath? Would you have a prayer meeting? God, is it really your will for me to take Fido here out of this pen and take him to water today? Or babe, or, or whatever type of animal you're talking about. Is it really your will for me to take care of them today? When they get caught in the fence, when they get caught in the hole, Three times Jesus does this. Is healing important to God? Why do we make it less so? Why is it so less important to us? Oh, the important thing is that you're born again. Yes, I agree. That, that is the important thing. But being born again, being saved also includes all this other stuff. And he is just as concerned about that. And we are not for some strange reason. Okay, woman with spirit infirmity. We got her healed. Awesome. 19, the 10 lepers. Luke 17, 11 through 19. Initiation, their faith, faith, faith mentioned, yes. Faith evidence, yes. Jesus called to them. Now, he didn't, they didn't come to him. They, were, they were stayed a distance away. They were practicing social distancing, even in the Bible. <laughs> Anyway, Jesus spoke to them and said, go to the priest. Lord, have mercy on us. Son of David, have mercy on us. Go to the priest. What is the only reason that you would go to the priest? If you have already been healed. Now, at this moment, were they healed? What does it say? As they went. So they had to start the process of going to the priest before their healing manifest. What processes do we have to start as if it has already taken place before our stuff manifests? God expects you to take that action, to take that step. What if they just sat there? I know Jesus said, go to the priest, but I don't feel healed right now. And I know it's a waste of my time. And I'm going to get in trouble if I go to the priest and I'm not healed. What if they just sat there? I'll fool with that. I don't have to do all that. I don't have to mess with that. They're staying in their, in their condition. 
they would have stayed lepers. They would not have been delivered from it. The action that they took, the faith that they displayed was Jesus spoke. He says we're healed, even though it doesn't feel like it, even though it doesn't look like it, I'm going to start walking that direction. And in the process of me walking that direction, the thing starts manifesting. By the time they get there, they are healed. Now, can't you imagine how happy they got on the, as they're walking? They, all 10 of them start walking back to the priest. And one of them, oh, wow, my, my finger's back to normal. My hands are clear. Wow, my arm is clear. Don't you know they had a praise service? The more steps they took in route to their healing, but they had to take that first step in faith. They had to hear what Jesus said, follow his instruction, and do it, even though there was nothing in their body that confirmed it. From the Old Testament? Yeah. Naaman. Naaman. Mm -hmm. Nope, he did not. His, his servant had to convince him, look, dude, you already come all this way. You might as well give this a shot. If he'd asked you to do some noble thing, wouldn't you have jumped on the opportunity? All he's asking you to do is jump in the river. What do you got to lose? And don't you know he was fr frustrated, I guess you'd say, seven times in that nasty old river? I'm only going to go six. What would happen? You can, you can get out of the river wet, smelly, and nasty, and still not healed. You choose. We don't get to instruct God on how we do this. We don't have the right to go to him and say, now, God, I, I expect you to heal me, and here's when, and here's how, and here's what I want it to look like, and here's my picture of how this is going to take place. You know what he's going to do? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, we'll see about that. I can just guarantee you that that is one way it's not going to happen to you. So the more ideas you come up with, the more ways God doesn't have opportunity to do it for you. All 10 of these guys were cleansed of leprosy. And then it says one of them came back. And to that one, your faith made you whole. What does that mean? The things that he had lost were restored. The things that he had been taken from were fixed, were replaced, all because he came back to give praise to Jesus who did the cleansing. Now, don't you know when those other guys saw the one, they're like, now, whoa, dude, why didn't I think about that? That's awesome. That's cool that you went back and got healed. Bummer, I didn't do that. And he was a stranger. He was a foreigner. He didn't even have a covenant. And Jesus pointed out that fact. Go ahead, Dan. Does that mean the other ones were? Yes. The other ones were part of the, the covenant, is, is my understanding, that, that they were Israelites and were entitled to walk in this. Go ahead, James. <laughs> Absolutely. Trained to sit there and take over and respond to questions, you know, 
and they had tried like the medical and they had tried the reading and, and, and for years and to the point where this book may not be decided. Okay. And so you know I prayed about it. I was like, I really feel like we need to start you on some medication. And this person also like prayed and they felt peace about it. And so I think that we often we can go into condemnation when we limit God to like, no, I want God to heal me this way. Right. You know. And, and so it was like making her go on a downward spiral because she's like, if I'm talking to my faith, you know, I'm like, listen, God wants you alive. Yes, you know, first and foremost, alive. exactly. Like, right. You gotta have you alive, you know. And so we don't get to choose. You know, we have to go with the leading of the Holy Spirit each time. Yes. And you have a unique perspective on that about the the other side of it. Uh, we get it from the, the side of, okay, should I do this or not? My doctor's saying this, should I, should I do it this way or not do it this way? Uh, you have the added mix, I guess you'd say of, okay, as a provider, how do I suggest that we move forward here? That's, that's awesome. The answer to a million and one questions is be led. Anytime you have a place where you can't find chapter and verse that says what's supposed to happen next, what do you need to do? You need to pray. You need to, you need to keep praying until you get peace one way or another about your course of action. And then once you get it, you need to stay on it. Don't mess around with anything else. Don't deviate from that. After you get peace about a treatment, a plan forward, stay there. We will start that and then our, our heads will kick in again. We go, oh, this isn't what I thought I was getting into. So I'm going to just skip this. And I'm going to go back to something else. Wavering toss to and fro by the waves of the ocean. Uh, James says that man will not receive anything from the Lord. So after you have peace about something, stay, stick it out. Stay the course. Stay there until it manifests. Stay there until God tells you to do something else. Have people been healed by medication? Yes. Have people been healed by changing things in their, their diet, changing things in their exercise? Yes. Have they been healed by surgeries? Yes. Have they been healed immediately? Yes. Have they been healed by therapy? Yes. All of these things are ways that God can heal you. And, I, and my statement is, I want to use every tool in the toolbox. Whichever tool is going to work the best for my situation is the tool I want to be using. Someone asked me one time, well, what's the best gift of the Holy Spirit? And the answer is whichever one you need. For whatever situation you're facing, whichever one you need at that moment is the best one at that moment. Tomorrow, that may not be true. The next situation you face, you may need a different gift. I think back to... Uh, Moses talking to the burning bush. It's one of my favorite illustrations. He asked God, who do you say, who, who, who should I say sent me? And without knowing it, he asked a hard question. How does God convince him of all that he is without going into an extended conversation? Let's say, I'm going to, I'm going to say I'm their deliverer. Well, what if they need a provider? I'm going to say I'm their provider. What if they need a healer? And I'm their healer, what if they need a sanctifier? And if I'm their sanctifier, what if they need peace? And if I'm their peace, what if they need a shepherd? And if I'm, and it goes on and on and on and on. How do I say who is sending him? So what do you come back to? I am that I am, or I will be whatever I need to be. That's who's sending me. That's awesome. I am the person that you need me to be even when you didn't even know you needed me to be that. I'm that. You're too clueless to even understand what it is you need, and I'm already there, and I'm already that person, and I've already got this thing laid out for you. The only answer that would have worked in that situation is I am that I am. But the, the, the amazing part to me about it is the difficulty of the question that Moses asked, and he didn't even realize the difficulty of the question that he just asked. And yet God, as only God can, I am that I am. I am, I will be whatever I need to be to get you through this, to get you out of this, to get you into the promised land. He brought them out 
they were no weak and feeble among them. They were carrying silver and gold. That's our deliverance. As we walk into our promised land, there's no weak or feeble among us, and we're carrying silver.